So as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of the Messiah, we, we have been kind of looking at people throughout the Scripture who point to Jesus, the, the coming Messiah. In Scripture, we, we call them kind of typologies or types of Christ. These are people in the Old Testament, uh, and we'll look at one in the New Testament who kind of uh, hold characteristics that point us to Jesus. And in Scripture, because it's literature, uh, the way God kind of wove his story together was that there were moments of foreshadowing is what we see. And so inside of this great narrative of God and his loving reign over this world and, and our kind of part in it, what he did is he put little small narratives in there that all point to the meta narrative of God. And so we looked at the birth of Isaac and then we looked last week at how Moses kind of pointed us to this idea that we are all meant to be people who help point people back to the ultimate redeemer of the Lord. And today we are going to look at the New Testament prophet John. And so uh, what's interesting about John is that God called John the Baptist to make way for the coming Messiah, Jesus. And John began doing this, this, this making a way, even before his birth. Now imagine that, like you are, are kind of re- stepping back, you're reading this story, and John the Baptist, his birth is foretold as we just read in Scripture, and what we're going to see this morning is that his calling was to point people to God. But what's so cool and what's interesting about this story is that he begins to function in that calling of pointing people to God while he is still in his mother Elizabeth's womb. And so for me, uh, as I read this portion of, of John's story, we can see this miraculous birth that is coming to his parents. But yet again, this is another foreshadowing moment of, of what's to come in the ultimate birth of Jesus. And, and if you'll remember what I just said is that God has sprinkled his greatness throughout all of the scriptures. And so as we kind of dive into this text, we need to remember that John's story is, is so extraordinary because he points to Jesus and all as, aspects of his life. E- even in the telling of John's birth story, Luke reco- records him pointing to Jesus. And, and as I read that in my own like personal quiet time, reflecting this sermon and kind of looking forward where we're going, I asked the question, can that be said of my life? Like if someone was to, to somehow record my life, would they say that my life pointed to Jesus? Certainly not at every moment, right? Certainly not B.C. as we call it in the church, before Christ. I, I, in case you don't know my story, I didn't get saved until I was 19. And so those first 19 years were suspect, right? Right? Or as the youngins call it, sus. But can, could this be said of our lives as we read J- John's story? He points to Jesus, even in his mother's womb. And for me, it just gives this moment of pause to go, God, that is what I want my life to be. I want it to be something that it's bigger than me. It's greater than anything I could ever do. And I want to just be a person who points back to you at all times. And so we're going to dive into this text so, to, so that we can kind of get to the, the greater meaning and the, this idea of how John is able to do this. A few years ago, uh, a friend of mine uh, was going through some mentoring classes and he was becoming a coach, a life coach. has just kind of been popular in the last couple of years. And he looked at me and said, hey, Chris, what is your 10-year life plan? And I kind of laughed at him like, to live. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. 10 years? Like, that's a long way away. I was probably 23, 24 at this point. And if you know anything about young 20-somethings, you know, we'll be blessed if they'll plan, you know, six months, right? Let alone 10 years. And so he goes, what, what if you were to look further? What if you were to look further and say, okay, I want to create a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, at the end of my life plan? I said, I don't want to think about that one, bro. Let's, let's not get there yet. And so what he did is he had me read this book, and we met together for several weeks, and we, we called this thing called Creating a Life Plan. And inside of this book, 
one of the authors was quoting another author, because that's how you write a book today. You just quote everybody else. And one of the things that po- po- stuck out to me was, at one point, this guy, Michael Gerber, is quoted inside of this book, and he says this. Trying to get us to understand this whole life plan and looking forward, he said, I'd like you to imagine that you're about to attend one of the most important occasions of your life. It will be held in a room sufficiently large to seat all of your friends, your family, your business associates, anyone and everyone to whom you are important and who is important to you. Can, can you see it? The walls are draped with deep golden tapestries. The lighting is subdued, soft, casting a warm glow on the faces of your expectant guests. The chairs are handsomely upholstered in a golden fabric that matches the tapestries. The golden carpeting is deeply piled. At the front of the room is dyes, and on the dyes are large, beautiful, decorated table with candles burning at either end. On the table in the center is the object of everyone's attention, a large, shining, ornate box. And in the box is you, stiff as the proverbial board. Do you see yourself lying in the box? Not a dry eye in the room. This is a great thing to read on a Sunday morning together, right? It's, it was a fantastic motivator in my life as this guy gave me a book. But, hey, plan your amazing life. Think about dying, is what he says. But the author of the book uses this illustration and he says, What will they say when I am long gone? And that's what John's story kind of points me to. As Luke is recording this gospel that is centered around Jesus, he takes just a second to bring up the story of John. And at every turn we see John, John's life is pointing to Jesus. That's what I want. And I pray and I I hope that you have that same yearning and desire in your heart that our lives will will be yet an offering to the altar of Jesus, and that we can make him known in all that we do. Now, you may be sitting there like me at times and going, yeah, but my past certainly doesn't glorify God. And that is the beauty of the God that we worship, that he created a new future for you. In his son, all things old are gone, and new has come. This majestic picture that I hope we all see this morning is that our desire and longing to lift Jesus high is a gift from God even before we walk the earth. And John models this for us. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. So we, we kind of read John's birth story, or, or I, I, I should say foreshadowing and, and prophecy of his birth And in these latter verses, verse 39 through 42, we're going to see an interaction between John's mom and Jesus' mom. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary, this is the mother of Jesus, arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah, remember, John's father. And greeted Elizabeth, John's mother. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So in this moment, what's already happened is that Mary has been given the promise of the coming Messiah, and obviously conception has already happened. The Holy Spirit has given Mary Jesus, and he is inside of her, and Elizabeth is also pregnant with John the Baptist. And as both women meet and greet each other, what happens? John leaps in the womb. And this isn't just some like moment where we can say, oh, it was probably coincidence, because What does the doctor, Luke, in case you didn't know, Luke was a doctor, very educated, very intelligent guy, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he gets rid of all possible naysayers saying, ah, you know, babies kick, it just happens, right? Babies just leap, it just so happens. But what did Luke offer in this recording? He said, Elizabeth 
was filled with the Holy Spirit. He tells us right there in this moment that when Mary and Elizabeth come into the room together, John doesn't just sense Mary's presence. She's awesome. She's, you know, a great mother, obviously. But she's not the one he's leaping for. He leaps because the Messiah has entered into his presence. And John is inspired by that. And what we see in the Scriptures is that the Holy, F- Holy Spirit then fills Elizabeth. And she is inspired by what is happening. This is no coincidence. This isn't just, oh, she's pregnant, you know, whatever. This is not one of those things. This is God showing us that there is purpose even before our birth. God calls the John, John the Baptist to make way for the coming Messiah, Jesus. And John began doing this even before he was born. In case you don't understand, that is my point to you this morning. That John, John the Baptist's calling did not begin the moment he walked this earth. It began when God gave him life in the womb. And, and in some ways, this is the very first proclamation of John the Baptist talking about the coming Messiah. Like, that's why he was created. He was created to proclaim, hey, someone greater than me, someone I'm unworthy to tie his sandals, he says, is coming. The Messiah is coming. And we see him in his mother's womb making a proclamation with his body, contorting and kicking, and I'm sure mom was super happy about it. But in that moment, he says, look, the Messiah has come. He is here. This is a joyous occasion. Another thing I love about this text is, is you may wonder why Christians are pro-life at times. You, you may go, uh, you know, what's, what's the value in life? And in this just one small example, we see that God has a calling on our lives even while we are pre-born. Like, there is a purpose in John as he is in his mother's womb. This type of calling for, for God's children is all throughout the scriptures. God speaks to Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 1.5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was set apart to be a prophet even prior to his birth, just like John the Baptist. Now, you might be thinking, okay, but what about the rest of us? Like, John the Baptist, special guy. Zechariah, special guy. What about me? What, what has God spoken over my life? Has he consecrated me? Has he chosen me? Because, you know, those people are special. They're in Scripture. Who am I? And Jesus speaking through the apostles, gives us a declaration that we are called in the same manner that John, Zechariah, Isaiah, and all the others were. You were chosen into a calling. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Get this. Even as he chose, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Not before 2022, not before that moment in your life, not even before you were born. You were chosen before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and blameless before him in love. Paul writing another letter to the church in Rome For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. As we get closer to the day that we celebrate Jesus' birth, the day that his birth actually happens to fulfill the purpose that God has for you and I, what we need to remember is that God has called you to lead your family well. Absolutely. Absolutely. He has called you to be a model employee, absolutely. He's called you to connect with the hurting and the broken 
Absolutely. But most importantly, what he has called you to is to be known by him and to make him known. Like you as a person in this world, God has said, know me. And when you know me, go make me known, both in word and in deed. That's your purpose. That's your gifting. That's your calling. Every single one of us have special things that we can do. We have special spiritual gifting. We have unique things in our lives. But all of us are united together in one thing, that God has called you, and then he has equipped you and called you to go and take that word to people. And John shows us this in his life. Paul echoes this in his letters. So just like John, you and I exist to point people to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The way you parent, the way you discipline, the way you drive. How about that one, right? The, the way you give a gift, the way you receive a gift, the way you have a conversation about that sports team that you think is awful. Do it all for the glory of God. We were given that calling before the foundation of the world. You were called, you were chosen. The scripture says you were adopted, redeemed, blessed, for new. Parents, recognize that the calling for your children is for you to raise them to follow the Lord. And to raise them to follow the Lord is not do as I say, not as I do. What are our kids learn most? They don't really learn our words most. I can promise you. I'm like trying to put my kids to bed last night, right? And bedtimes are fun. Hey, guys, let's go to bed. Let's brush our teeth. Let's do the whole thing. Let's do Advent. You know, on and on and on. All right, guys, go to bed. 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 But if I walk with them, I go put them in bed. I tuck them in. I pray over them. I sing a song. I walk, and I go get myself in bed. Generally speaking, what do they do? They stay in the bed, generally speaking. There's a caveat there. It doesn't always work. But our kids learn from the way we behave. Our kids are watching us in that moment when we get that phone call where somebody's dropping a hammer on us. Something goes bad at work. Something happens in our personal life we don't like. We're at the dinner table and somebody drives us nuts and we lose control. They remember what we do in every moment. Parents, to disciple your kids is not to just bring them to church on a Sunday. It is that. But it's also walking with the Lord yourself day in and day out. Does that mean you have to be perfect? No. Matter of fact, I believe some of the strongest faiths are when we can show our kids how broken we are, and yet God comes in the middle of it and says, I still love you. Like, I, I at times want my son to see that I stink as a person. Because if he thinks, oh, dad's just really great preacher, blah, 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 blah. And then he one day wakes up from that reality. And he goes, dad's not so great. His world's going to be shattered. But if he can see you from the very beginning, hey, man, I, I mess up a lot. But God's grace is greater than any misfortune or mishap that I ever have in my life. He'll begin to see how God has woven our faith and his grace together. And it's not just my commitment to him. It's more so Jesus' commitment to me. Scripture says that he has given me faith. And so I go through the process of submitting myself to the Lord, showing my wife love, showing my kids respect and honor and love. And when they see this picture and I explain it to them, we talk about the Bible, we talk about hard things, they'll begin to get a picture as their brains form and as their physical features form and hopefully as their spiritual heart forms, what they'll begin to see is that you know what? God loves me through my imperfections. I don't have to be perfect because Jesus is. Parents, we need to disciple our children. Church, one of the examples that we see in John's life is that the next generation matters now. And so we can't just look off in the future and say, hey, when they become a certain age, then they can begin to lead. Then they can become people of God. 
God has called and equipped people to lead now. And so any child who puts their faith in Jesus is the church today. Not the church tomorrow. They're the church now. Timothy's leading a church in Ephesus. And Paul writes him a letter and says, Hey, don't let anyone put you down because of your age. He's leading in a culture where mostly gray-haired men are the leaders of this church. And here's young Timothy coming in and leading these people. And Paul says, don't stun it. You have the Lord. John models for us. Even in early in life, we can point people to God. And church as a people who are about Jesus and about the calling that he's put on our lives, we need to be a people about lifting up the next generation. We need to be a people who are passionate about seeing kids come to faith in Christ. I saw a statistic earlier this week. It said 77% of, of Christ followers came to faith before they were 18 years old. 77% of Christ followers came to faith before they were 18 years old. That's not to say that they, someone can't come to faith in Christ after they're 18. I was 19. But what it is to say is those formative years are so important for you and I to model faith, both as parents, as friends, as the church, as leaders. I had someone uh, at a Christmas party this past week, I was talking about the difficulties of raising PKs, and that's church terms for pastor's kids. I was one, and it's very difficult. I've been a youth pastor of pastor's kids. It's extremely difficult to be a pastor's kid. And so I was just telling them about all the things that I'm kind of not, not, not fearful of, but aware of and just kind of patiently walking through. And they said, you know what you need to get? You need to have people that can speak into your kids. And I said, exactly. God gave the church so that you and I would have people to speak into our lives so that we could speak into other people's lives. He didn't give us these green chairs for you to come and just sit and hear a good sermon. He says, be active. Now that you are known and you have, admit, uh, you have followed the calling of God, now you need to go make him known to people. Go talk to those around you. We all need to remember that it's our job to point people to Jesus. And as I, that is our job, it is our responsibility to do that for the next generation. So I'll ask you a question. Where are you serving in this church to equip the next generation? Student ministry, treehouse, all-stars. We've been given a, a huge task to raise these children to love God, love people, and invest in his kingdom. And I heard this illustration several years ago. Our student children and, and, and nursery curriculum uses a thing called orange. And several years ago, they came out with this idea called It's Just a Phase. And what they did is they talked about how every kid kind of goes through phases in life. And my family and I are experiencing phases now. Like, my son last night had a full set of teeth. He walks in this morning, and he's missing his front tooth. Like, it's a phase that we're going through, and I told him he can go get a job at Waffle House now. Like, he's there. (laughs) Front tooth missing. If you're a Waffle House employee, I'm sorry. I love your food. Thank you for continuing to serve. Appreciate you. (laughs) But this orange curriculum several years ago talked about how in... A child's life, as soon as a a baby is born to these parents, we have 936 weeks until they graduate. And these marbles right here represent 936 weeks. There's technically 936 marbles here, but we're going to pretend that's 936 right there, okay? Just makes better illustration. So each one of these is a week of your child's life. Each one of these is a week that you have to disciple them, to mentor them, to love on them, to to show them the right way, to give them some area to mess up and to fail. Some in the room are down to kind of this, right? You have seniors in the room, and in just a few months, they are no longer going to be in your household, Lord willing. But they they are no longer just... Your little baby child anymore. They're still your child, but now they're adults. Some of you have experienced this over the past several years. And what the point of this is, is for each and every one of us to remember that as life comes and goes, as parents and as church family members, 
There's only a certain number of these that we get. Max is 936. And as people of God, what we need to remember is that each individual week is extremely important. And we need to do all that we can to instill in this next generation that God loves them. And he's called them and he's given them a purpose. Some of you have newborns and so your, your thing is really full. I challenge you to take advantage 936 weeks. How do you want to be intentional about raising your child for the next 930 weeks, 926 weeks? Maybe you've got 400 weeks left. Maybe you've got 200 weeks left. Whatever that looks like, how are you going to push them to the gospel, model it for them? Because at the end of the weeks, they're gone from your house. They might come back again because it happens, right? Right? But we got, it. we got 936 weeks to point these kids to Jesus. And church, it's not just on the parents. It's on me and you to support the families and to come alongside of them and say, you know what, we're going to be there to be voices for you. When your kid goes through a difficult time, I can be a shoulder there for them. If they want to learn a sport, and I'm really good at this sport, or I coach this sport, I can teach them this. If they're looking for a job, I can help them get a job. You don't have to parent on your own. That's not why the church exists solely, right? To just sit back and let you, hey, we're going to teach you how to do it, but we're not going to walk alongside of you. The church says, no, no, no. We are joined up, chain by chain, link by link together, walking through life. And I hope that's why you're here, is that you see Piedmont as the kind of place where you go, I want to build relationships with people to help not just develop me, but help develop the next generation. And if you're someone who kind of just comes in and goes out, I love you to death, and I pray I pray that you find a place to connect, and I pray that that place is here. Because what we are not looking to do as a church is to just have people walk in and walk out. That's not what we're looking to do. There's a lot of really great churches in our community. that That's kind of their goal. That's not what we want. I want you to plug in. I want you to be here. I want you to know the people in the room. There's not that many of us, and that's a gift. Like, you walk into some places, and there's like a billion people and you go, how am I ever going to get to know someone? I, I, I've pastored in churches like that. I've been in churches like that. There are blessings inside churches like that. Don't let me, don't, don't leave here going, wow, Pastor Chris blasted a mega church. Not true. There's amazing things they do. But each church, God, just like people, God has given us a unique calling. And because we are this kind of tight-knit, small community, our unique calling needs to be taking advantage of that like to knowing each other, to praying for each other, to caring for each other. Because when something happens in your life that's difficult, you don't have to be alone. You're not just a number on a roll. You're not just an attendance mark, a giving unit. You're a person. And I want to know you. But I can't know you by myself. We, we have to know each other. It takes commitment. And that's what it means to raise the next generation. So when we see, when we see John's life, when we see this picture of John pointing towards Jesus, all of a sudden what we're seeing is that God has a calling for us to be the church together. That's why Jesus came, to give you and I newness of life. And John proclaims that newness even in his mother's womb. Well, we proclaim it today. As I close, and the band comes up in just a second, I want you to think about this over the Christmas break. Obviously, we have the Christmas Eve service on Friday. We have church at home on the 26th. But you're going to be really busy over the next week or so. And what I want you to think about is what does 2022 hold for you as a people of God here? Like, will we begin to walk in the calling of God's life to know each other, to love each other? When, when the pastor or one of the people up here on the stage says, hey, go around the room and shake somebody's hand and introduce yourself, do you go, I don't know these people, and I don't want to know these people? Or do you go, you know what, I, I may not know a lot of people, but I'm going to meet one today. And we're going to talk more than the Braves or the Bulldogs or the weather. But I want to know somebody. Because God has called us to know each other. So that we can point each other back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May you do that this Christmas season. May we do that in 2022. If you're sitting there this morning and you're going, Pastor Chris, I have no idea what time with the gospel. Jesus came and, and John sees or hears kind of 
the Messiah inside of Mary's womb. And what the Messiah comes, Jesus is birthed. He lives a perfect life. And at the end, around he's 33 years old, he's then crucified on a cross, even though he's completely innocent. He's never sinned. He's never broken a law. He's never done anything wrong. And he takes on the sin of all of the world. And he's murdered on a cross. Three days later, he comes back from the dead. He resurrects. And he then ascended and sat and is sitting at the right hand of the Father today. And he says, if you put your faith in me, You're no longer guilty of your sin either. I have made it good in my blood. I am the sacrificial lamb as foretold in the Old Testament and John pointed to as the Messiah. So all you got to do is repent, put your faith in him. Repent and put your faith in him. You can do that this morning. We're going to sing a song here in just a second. I'll be down front. You can find me afterwards. You can shoot us an email at info at piedmontchurch.net. We'd love to walk with you on what it looks like to become a Christ follower or to get baptized or to join the church. We call it having a seat at the table. Church, let's walk in the newness of life, leading people to love God, love people, and invest in his kingdom. Let's pray. God, I just pray that we will see the importance of the calling that you have on each and every one of our lives, that we are chosen, adopted, redeemed in your Son, Jesus Christ. And when we receive that gift, you call us to then go out and make your name and your fame known and your renown through this world. We're not called to just sit idly by, but we're called to be the people of God who go out and make proclamation as, as we parent, as we work, as we drive as we mentioned earlier in all things that we do we are to give you the glory and the honor and so god i just pray that you'll equip us you'll you'll give us the encouragement we need to do that you'll show us that our past is dead and gone and the new has come in christ i pray that if there's someone in here who has not repented and put their faith in you i pray that they'll do that this morning that you'll draw their heart near to yours Help us become the people of God that you have called us to be even before the foundation of the world. It is in your son's precious name I pray these things, Jesus Christ. And the church said...